Welcome to Focus Today. I'm your host, Perry Atkinson. Delighted to have in the studio with us our good buddy, Mr. Patrick Doyle. He heads up uh, Veritas Counseling. And we're going to talk about a subject today that is um, going to be a little bit of an adjustment for some. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a subject that uh, even Jesus talked about, yeah. the hardness of hearts. Yeah. And uh, I would say that probably is the beginning basis of most divorces, isn't it? It's, I, I would say hardness of heart is the reason that every relationship that fails, fails, regardless of the kind of relationship, whether it's a marriage, a employee, mother, daughter, father, son, you know, friends, whatever. Any relationship that fails, I think that is the bottom line reason. What is a hard heart? Well, before we get into that, okay. let's <laughs> identify this, All right. that I have a hard heart. Okay. Everyone has a level of hardness. Right. So uh, I notice in my own life that I always like for other people to have the problem, you know, though those people have hard hearts. But let's, let's be more honest and look at ourselves because if we're not, that might be a sign that we got a hard heart, mm. right? Because if you're always putting it out there and never looking in, which is, you know, contrary to what, you know, our faith asks us to do. And if I believe and know that God loves me and He knows everything, including my hard heart, then I'm safe to take a look at myself. Mm -hmm. And when you won't take a look at yourself, that's a sign that you might have a hard heart. Because who is without problems? Who is out without failure? Right. Who is doing it perfectly? No one. So taking a look at yourself is one of the first things we need to do. So. Hardness of heart is a state that you are unrepentant. Now, again, people say, well, I'm not unrepentant. Well, what about down to the smaller things? Like you bark at your child and you're justified because they did something wrong. Mm -hmm. And you bark at them and it hurts them. Mm -hmm. But you don't ever deal with it. That's hardness because it's not having compassion for the person you love. So it can be in small ways, or it can be in big ways, like I'm having an affair, and I've hardened my heart so much that I've justified walking away from my marriage and my children, and blah, 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 blah. <coughs> and remember, hardness doesn't start at the high end. It starts at the low end. And so one of the things I wanted to talk about today is that we always, we always want to talk about the big ticket items, mm -hmm. right? The things that are really big, the, the, the pastor who's sleeping with people in his congregation and preaching on Sunday, or the, you know, the doctor who's taking advantage of his patients, or the woman who's having an affair on her husband. Or, but, you know, everybody's like, oh, that's obvious, right? Well, no one gets there overnight. Mm -hmm. They don't wake up one morning and go, oh, I know. <laughs> it's one denial after another. Small denials, small rationalizes, small justifications, until you get to a point where you're so hardened that you can pretty much justify anything. And, you know, we, we, we talk about this a lot in addiction because you see the end result of hardness with somebody who's completely given over to a substance. And you, the way they act is so obvious, you know, they'll run over their mother to get their drug. You know, whatever they got to do, they'll do. Their heart becomes absolutely hardened and completely self-focused. That's easy. But that person didn't start there. Mm -hmm. They started somewhere else. And so one of the, the hopes I have in today is that I'll get a lot of people to, who are listening who aren't at the end of the line and having severe consequences because their hearts are hard. But... Maybe some folks we can be preventative with who are toying with some things. And you know, I can testify, one, the reason why this topic is coming up is because of my own life and the things that I keep going through and the difficulties that I face and the situations that I'm in and how I respond to them and the relationships that I have with my children, my wife, my friends, people in my church. You know, my heart does not stay open. The world is a harsh place. There are people trying to harm me. There's people doing me wrong. There's people mistreating me. I'm mistreating people. My kids are not perfectly obedient. My wife is not a perfect soul. And so all that pain, if I don't deal with it, will lead me to some level of hardening as a way to cope. Uh, boy, this opens up a big can of worms. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because um, I know people who choose to remain hard. Yes as a means of not getting hurt again. Yep. Oh boy. 
I can testify to that one. That's, that's how I lived the vast majority of my young life. Okay. And I was so hurt by what happened in my family with my dad that I was like just shut down. I, and I was justified in my mind. Look, why would I open up? Look at what's happened to me. I'm not going to do that. And in that state of hardness, do you think I was kind to other people? <laughs> no, I was not kind to other people. And I was unkind, harsh, abusive, whatever. And in my own mind, completely justified. So as a result of my justifying that behavior and my hardness, I had no way to take in information that would cause me to be not to be something else. So I was impervious to conviction, <clears throat> which is really ultimately the antidote to hardness of heart. But one of the problems I see, particularly in the Christian community, is that we, we justify smaller things. We don't allow the conviction on smaller things. We want to put it on the bigger things. Mm -hmm. But no one gets to a bigger thing without the smaller thing. And so that's why you find a guy like Ted Haggart in the bathroom with a male prostitute and methamphetamines. I mean, how did that guy, who's the pastor of a church and head of the family council or whatever it was, how does he get from his position as this great Christian leader to being in the bathroom with a male prostitute and some methamphetamines? Uh, you, you're hitting on a big nerve here because uh, somewhere along the line, a believer yields to something that they perhaps don't even realize the power of it because yeah. uh, you've categorized... I, you know, I'll never forget interviewing Jim Baker mm -hmm. and, and when he went through all... And he was the founder of PTL and all of that was years ago. Yeah. But he basically said, they just said, 95% of my life is in order, but the 5% that I concealed... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he thought... He actually thought he had a special arrangement with God. In other <laughs> words, he knew what he was doing was wrong... Yeah. But because God didn't zap him, yes. it must have been some kind of a okay. Blessing, right. I'll repent on it. I'll repent of it every night, but I'll do it again tomorrow. Yes. Right. <laughs> that makes sense? Yes. And that is a sign of hardness. Or <clears throat> an, <clears throat> a uh, psychological word that we could put on it would be denial. No one has a hard heart that doesn't have denial. Hmm. So when I see the pain of someone else, and I become hardened to it, and I, I don't have any compassion for it. Yeah. You know, I'm denying that reality. So God comes along with His Spirit, uh, according to Scripture, and He convicts. And His conviction leads us to the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Which is the opposite of denial. Because it also leads to where you, you probably don't realize it, but you have to be in control of everything. Well, you're certainly, you're certainly doing the mental gymnastics. Because if you're not, <clears throat> then you get caught for being a phony. So you have to be in control. Right. So even at the point of right. denial, you're... Right. Or you have to deal with the consequences of what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, so many times I see people who are um, in denial to avoid the consequence, right? Mm -hmm. the, in, but you and I both know that denial doesn't help you avoid consequences. It creates them. Right. So... Mm -hmm. The only thing that helps you avoid consequences is the truth. The problem is, I hear this all the time. Well, I told the truth. Kids say this. Well, I told the truth, like, so I shouldn't be in trouble, right? <laughs> I told the truth, so yeah. there shouldn't be any consequences. Well, if I'm harming people, there's consequences. If you tell the truth, you repent, you become convicted, that's good. But it doesn't mean you get out of the consequences. The consequences are necessary. And I was saying this, I say this a lot, particularly in marriage counseling and people who are in abusive situations. Adam and Eve were in the garden. And they had this very intimate relationship with God, right? It was very close. He walked with them every day. They got to enjoy what He created for them. They got to do whatever they wanted. God just said, just one thing, don't mess with that. Okay, because if you mess with that, it's going to mess you up. So don't touch that. But everything else you can do. So they have this great intimacy with God. And what, you know, the story, what did they do? Well, they did that one thing, and then what did God do? He just kind of winked and said, ah, no big deal, and kept going. No. He kicked them out of the garden, put a gate, posted an angel with a flaming sword, <laughs> which is a pretty strong message of, you're not getting back in. And then after he kicked them out, he consequenced them. Right? Right. Was that loving? Probably didn't seem so, no. but it was. Right. So the consequences to our harm 
is very loving and very necessary for our healing. Mm -hmm. But all of us want to say, I don't have any consequences, I want to get out of the consequences. And here's where we're in our, and I see it in the church all the time, is we want to use God as a consequence eraser. Yep. Well, that's well put because um, it's amazing what we can spiritually justify. Exactly. We can cut and paste scripture to say anything right. we want it to right. say. Instead of having a soft, broken heart, and I would say the, uh, the broken heart, and I, when I mean that, I don't mean that in the sense that somebody betrayed you. I mean the broken heart. of You're broken by the love of God. Yeah. He knows you're wrong. He knows what you've done. And instead of condemning you or kicking you out or turning his face from you, he embraces you with profound love. And that love breaks your heart into pieces in a good way that makes you humble and open and receiving, which are totally different from the hardness of heart symptoms, which is you're hardened and you're, 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 you're selfish and you're you're, re you're um, resistant to information. You don't accept responsibility for your actions and on down the line. And so those two things happen to us multiple times every day. All right, let me take a quick break here. Uh, Patrick Doyle's with okay. us from Veritas Counseling. We're dealing with the subject of hard hearts. Jesus talks about this. And uh, the question is, you may even know that your heart is hard, but you choose not to deal with it. Yeah. Now you got a bigger problem. Yeah, we'll talk about that when we get back. Hi, I'm Paulina, and I work at the Deaf TV. Did you know that when you support the Deaf TV, you have a profound impact, not only in our community, but around the world? It's your continued support that takes the inspiration and hope in the programs we produce and makes them available to the thousands of people who are watching these videos online every week. Help bring encouragement and hope to our valley and beyond by making a secure online donation today at our website, thedove.us. Okay, we're back uh, with uh, Patrick Doyle, Veritas Counseling. We're dealing with a subject today that uh, I think sooner or later we all kind of deal yeah. with. It. The question is how you deal with it. Sooner or later you will deal with it or it will deal with you. Uh, and that's the subject of a hard heart. Jesus talked about it. Um, uh, the scripture deals with it. I think Moses and his crowd dealt with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. But this, the question I asked you when we going to the break was, um, people that have a hard heart. Yeah. And they know their heart. In fact, they probably can describe as to why they are yep. hard and they've given right. justification. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be hurt again. Yep. I'm not going down that road right. again. Right, right. Uh, I'm never going to marry again, right. et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they choose to ignore the hardness of the heart. Mm -hmm. You see it as a protection. So how dangerous is that? Well, I think what it does is it severely limits your life. Um, you know, you're not designed to live with a hard heart. And I totally get it. I mean, I, I've experienced things in my life that made me not want to ever experience those things again. And so one of the things that you're getting at is that can you have a boundary where there's somebody in your life who's harmful and yet have a soft heart? Do you have to harden your heart to have the boundary? Or can you have a boundary that's protective of you and have a soft heart? And see, that's the thing that I think that happens in the church is that we, we justify the hardness to protect ourselves because there is a real offense going mm -hmm. on or has gone on, but we deny the fact that that's really not good for us. I mean, and I, I, can, I can tell you that having a boundary with a soft heart is a process that is very difficult because if there's someone in your life, and I see this in marriages all the time, Perry, I say it to people all the time, there's only one thing that destroys a marriage. It's hardness of heart. If you have two soft-hearted people, you can work out anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen people, uh, just a couple of the friends of mine that just got remarried a couple weekends ago, were divorced, you know, there was infidelity in the marriage, they worked it out, they repented, you know, and they changed a lot of things that led them to that, and now they're remarried again. They both had a soft heart, it can work out. Um, I've seen other situations where there's no soft heart in the group, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, and so people go their separate ways. But if somebody is doing you harm, having a soft heart doesn't mean taking their harm. If, they ta if you take their harm, you don't protect yourself, I'm guaranteeing you your heart will harden. Is resentment a hard heart? Absolutely. It's, a, it's a definitely a symptom. 
and it's one of the main symptoms. Um, and you know, all of us have a, a sense of resentment about some things, and it's a process. And the other thing I want people to know is that look, this stuff isn't, you know, mm. I took the pill I better. Yeah. No, this is a process where you have to really cope with some stuff. So having a having an I see it in marriages. So you have one person in a marriage who's really being harmed by the other. And the other person is in denial and they rationalize and they minimize and they justify and they never come clean. And the hardest people to deal with are the ones that spiritualize. That then they take the scripture and they put it on the person who's being hurt and blame them for their issue. You seen this before? No. This is the worst. So, uh, and, I mean, that is, that is abuse. It is. It's, it's spiritual abuse. It's emotional abuse. It's, it's all, all down the line. So, so the person that's in that situation where they're being harmed and they're having, you know, scripture thrown at them and they're having the person justify their behavior. I mean, a hard heart is, inevit is, is an inevitability. But my thing is, is that I say, if, you know, find a boundary and protect yourself from that person and ask God to give you grant you forgiveness because ultimately that's what you need it, now we've talked about it before and if anybody has questions they should find my show on forgiveness and reconciliation because that's where I go through explain that but forgiveness remember is not saying that what that person is doing to you is okay forgiveness is about you trusting God for the justice of what that person is doing okay you can't control it if we could control justice the world would look rather different, wouldn't it? <laughs> Let me ask you this. Uh, can I go spiritual on you for a minute? I hope so. <laughs> All right, you got a hard heart. Yes. And you're taking communion. Yes. Are you in danger of violating things here? Theologically, I don't think so. I think that's what you should be doing if your heart's hard. You should, because what Jesus was saying is, I'm, do this in remembrance of me as if to say... Yeah, but you got odd against this person. You, would, that's a good thing to do, is, and ask God to, to, to give you conviction, to commune with God and say, God, where am I wrong? I don't think I've ever taken communion in a clean state, because I'm a sinner. No, I understand that. I mean, and that's the right attitude of taking communion. Right. But we take it anyway, and we still have this resentment and, mm -hmm. and hardness in our heart. Well, without God's intervention, I won't know that because I'll justify it. And so what I'm saying is I would go to communion and say, God, if I'm here with something against my brother, let me know so I can go make it right. Well, that was his instruction. Mm -hmm. If you bring your sacrifice and you have something against your brother, or you know he has something against you is what he said. You know he has yeah, something. Yeah, but he hurt you. me, so I'm yeah. okay with that. Right, and there's the beginning of your hardness. Yeah. Because now you're denying, justifying, rationalizing, minimizing, spiritualizing. You're doing all that stuff to avoid reality instead of dealing with reality. And listen, avoidance seems way easier in the short run because I don't have any consequences. I don't have to deal with being uncomfortable. I don't have to think about what you know that might do to my relationship and you know it's gonna be awkward and so I can avoid all that and just you know keep going and so but my th my thing is this you can pay a little now or a lot later <laughs> mm -hmm. it's the old mechanics adage you know you can fix it now and it'll cost you this or you can wait and you can replace your engine so it's the same thing we we do it and so um, you know we in, in, a, in a state of immaturity we always want to satisfy our impulses. Hmm. In a state of immaturity, we always want to do what's most convenient. Maturity is the ability to postpone short-term gratification for long-term goals. Mm -hmm. But ah, I say this with love and respect, but as a group of people known as Christians, we have become very immature because we're very much interested in the quick fix. But you don't see any really of that in the, in the scriptures. All right. So if someone got healed, for example, the blind man, do you think his life was different automatically? Yes. Did that, do you think the trouble stopped? Here's a guy who all he has ever done is begged. He doesn't know how to do anything else. He's been blind since birth. Now we can see what's he going to do? There's no social security. Mm -hmm. His life just changed radically. It didn't mean that he just exchanged one set of problems for another. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that everything was better, that's not, that's not legitimate. That's not real. And so when we're thinking that way, that's a sign 
that you're probably going to be in a hardness state because you're avoiding reality. When you are dealing with a couple, um, is it possible to have one with a soft heart and one with a hard heart? It happens all the time. And the, and the one that has a soft heart is the one that's made the appointment. Oh. And the other one's being drug along on some level. You know, they're going to be nice about it, but yeah. you can tell. You, you talk to them and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they don't really want to do any work. They don't want to look at anything. It, they're just like checking the box. I went to counseling. You know, and so somebody who really wants to change. So I also did a show a long time ago called 10 Signs You're a Victim, 10 Signs You're a Survivor. And I see this all the time in counseling. The one who wants things to change, they're wanting to survive. They want to, they're going to put all their resources they have into fixing this thing. Whatever we got to do, let's do it. And then the victim's like, well, you know, I don't know. maybe because I, well, what about this? And they're doing everything they can to avoid change hmm. because they want to stay the victim instead of fixing it. And so I believe the only thing that changes that is God's revelation of himself. He's got to show you where you're wrong. And you and I know, I've, yeah. been, I've been through it so many times where I just was, went through it this weekend, um, where, you know, I had a hard heart toward my wife about some things. I mean, not, not insignificant. It was hard. And over through a series of events, God was like, you know, hey, how you doing? <laughs> how you doing over there? <laughs> Don't make me come over there and break no fingers, you know. Uh, so... And he convicted me, and um, my heart became softened. And I, uh, w w what accompanied that was a lot of tears and repentance, and you know, and the result of that was intimacy. We came closer. Okay, but w w most people would look at me and think that I would never have a hard heart. How could I, you know, in my position and what I do, and blah 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 I blah. <laughs> I, I know yeah. him. <laughs> yes, yes, he does. I've seen him angry. <laughs> So, uh, you know, what I'm, what I'm saying is, is that no one's exempt. And thank God he's merciful and he convicts me. Thank God that he didn't let me continue in that because that would have destroyed me. That would have destroyed my wife. would have destroyed my kids. would have hurt everyone. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful that, and I, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't get myself out of the trap. I needed help. And so when you are in a position where you're the only one that can do it, that's a sign of hardness. I don't, have the, I don't have the insight to know I need help. Yeah, but a big part of this is ego. So oh, at what point yeah. did you put your ego down? Well, I, I didn't. God busted through and like showed up and said, hey, look at this. I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's the same thing as Paul. He's on the road to Damascus, on his way to do his thing. He's justified. He's spiritualized. He's going to just kill some more people and put him in jail. And God's like, bam, mm -hmm. knocks him off his horse and says, hey. Cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, where does, uh, before I take a break, where does communication come into this? Because uh, it seems to me that hardness of heart is going to create a, almost a communication impasse. It does. It does. You can, <laughs> I know a lot of people that talk, but don't communicate. And it's what I call the looping argument. They're communicating about the same thing, and it, it goes in the same cycle and ends up in the same bad place. And you do that for a month, a year, or 10 years, you, you, but you never get any resolve. Softness of heart is what brings people to taking responsibility for their actions. And that is what transforms relationships from unhealthy to healthy. And no one in any relationship is without the need of taking responsibility. Yeah, somebody's got to be the adult and step up. And I think both people have to because both people are wrong. I've never met two people in a relationship where both of them weren't sinners. Can, I'll ask you this, we'll take a break. Can this thing you call circular argument yeah. or circular communication, uh -huh. doesn't that lead to hardness of heart? Oh, Why absolutely. bother? I mean, it's the oh, same yeah. thing all the time. Absolutely. All right, we'll be right back with Patrick Doyle in just a moment, talking about hard hearts. Hi, I'm Paula, and I work at the Dove TV. Every day we get letters and emails from people who've been encouraged, blessed, and challenged by the programs on the Dove TV. But we couldn't do it without you. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to bring inspiration and hope to our community by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or call us at 541-776-5368.
Okay, we're back with Patrick Doyle, uh, heads up Veritas Counseling on a subject that I think sooner or later we all deal with, yeah. one level or another. It could happen in relationships with family and spouses. Certainly can happen in, in business, mm -hmm. you know. Big time. Um, I've made a few determinations in my business career. I will <laughs> not do that again. <laughs> I will not do business with that person again. Yeah. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, yeah. you know. Yeah. Hard heart, yep. <laughs> Guilty, <laughs> absolutely. Is Have he, I repented? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's part of the thing, though, is that when someone has harmed you, it's good to have a boundary and not, I mean, in particular in business, you know, I, I've done a, quite a bit of business consulting. And so, you know, when someone has proven themselves to be untrustworthy, dishonest, you should have a boundary against doing business with them. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. The, the, the difference is I have the boundary without the hatred. I have the yeah. boundary okay. with and the softness. Excellent point. Excellent point. Because I've had to clear my heart yes. so that I can take communion right. with a clean spirit. Because right. I knew that I would be in violation. Because that's how God convicts me. Right. Okay. All right. So right. I, had to have, I had to have a clean heart. Right. Because there have been times where I was angry and I passed the cup by. And I thought, <laughs> I knew enough to know that I can't do this. Right. Okay. But I think some of the worst hardness that can occur is when you've been violated by a spiritual leader or a church. A brother or sister, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have been thrown under the bus by a couple of pastors, and I can tell you, all of a sudden, root canals without Novocaine were fun. <laughs> right. You know, right. I'm sure it's nothing like that's never happened to you. I've never experienced that, but I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so you can't talk about that one. Yeah. But the point <laughs> is, is that it's occurring. Oh, absolutely. And on top of that, you get spiritual abuse. And um, so there's a lot of offenses out there. Yeah. Take the world condition right now. It right. is hardening us. Yeah. Well, uh, that might be another subject for another show, but yeah, I have, I have, uh, I have Go ahead. asked many people yeah. in my office to please stop watching news. Yeah. Because they're anxious, they're angry. It's they're, cynical. They're it's cynicism on steroids. Yeah, they're overwhelmed, yeah. and they're on a they're a constant diet of criticism, you know, intensity, yeah. arguing, you know, about issues that aren't going to be solved today mm -hmm. or tomorrow. Um, and so, what you feed yourself on a regular basis, you know, boy, do I hear from that crowd. Yeah, wow. has you know a, a big effect on us. And so, uh. and again, I don't think that it's wrong for believers to be involved in politics. I think that's a great thing. I think we need to be. Mm. But don't be fooled by thinking that your involvement in politics is the answer. No. I've always said activism is a form of evangelism. Yeah. But the moment evangel activism eclipses evangelism, yep. get out. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. if I'm in it because it's, it's my conviction that God wants me to serve in this way, I do it very differently than I'm going to be right. Yeah. I'm going to make things happen. And trust me, I have been the, you know, activist evangelist yeah. in my past where I see the injustice. And having had so much injustice when I was a kid, I had a really strong hatred for injustice that I spiritualized. And then I went to work carrying the flags of whatever thing I thought was necessary. Right. And I did it. And I may have been absolutely right, Perry, but I was totally wrong because of the way I was feeling about it, my spirit behind it. So when I'm jumping on someone's chest with all fours and telling them what's right, that's completely wrong. You don't see the Son of God, who was God incarnate, doing that. He didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so I had, to, I had to yeah. repent and go, but did he change the world? Did he affect politics? Did he help? Yes. And, that, and that's our example. We need to be an agent of change. But the agent of change that we need to be is by dealing with our own hardness first. Let's bring this hardness thing into a family setting. I, okay. we, we can spend a lot about abuses in the church yeah. and business. Yeah. goes on every yeah. day. Yep. But for those watching and listening today, let's, let's bring it back into the family. It could okay. be a hardness towards a spouse mm -hmm. or a hardness towards a child. Right. Right. Huh. And... Um, there's an old saying, if your ministry doesn't work at home, don't export it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our proving ground of our spirituality and our Christianity really starts within yeah, the home. Yeah, exactly. So a person is sensing that, wait a minute, I'm out of, I know I got this hardness. I know that this bitterness has, 
has now reached a level of hardness. Right. Uh, and yet I feel justified in it because of whatever this person's done or said. Right. What would you say to that person to, to well, change things? First thing I would say is I understand. I understand why you feel that way. I understand how. I understand that that's a real feeling that you're hurt or you're angry or you've been the victim of that person's behavior for a long time. I know in my marriage, I've I have hurt my wife over long periods of time, thinking that I was doing the right thing or helping or that I, I, I denied or rationalized what I was doing and how it was harming her. And I believe she's done the same. I have you know a kid I'm sending off to college next week, and so you know. There's been hurt. There's been disobedience. There's been, you know, hardness on both sides. And so how do you, I mean, you're describing my life. I, I have this. And so if I say to, say, let's just say, I say to my wife, look, when you do X, Y, or Z, it bothers me. And I need you to change that because it's, I can't deal with it. And I'm not asking her not to, you know, wear her hair a certain way or whatever. I'm asking her about, you know, something that's legitimate like the, that you're you're harming me when you say that, or you know that you're you're being unkind to me. It, it hurts me. Whatever. I'm not. T I'm talking about legitimate issues. And that person is in a process of change, and it's not in immediate, right? Or they're in denial, and they see what I'm saying as some unrealistic, weird, uh, non-real thing. They they don't see it. So, I see a lot of marriages where. There's harm going on because the person doing the harm is in denial about what they're doing. And so yeah. the person who's asking for the change keeps looking at them like, you know, <laughs> then, they, then the person who asks for the change starts to doubt themselves. Well, maybe I'm asking too much. Maybe, it's too, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. And so when someone's in denial and they rationalize, minimize, justify, spiritualize, it makes the person they're with feel a little crazy. Because you can never resolve anything. Mm -hmm. Okay? It so, goes around and around and around. Exactly. So when you have a softness and the person looks at you and says, you know, when you do that, it bothers me. And, and the person that you say it to goes, oh, wow. Well, I, that, that's not good. I don't want to do that. Tell me more about that. How do I do that? And, oh, wow. Okay, I wanna, I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to look inside myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at myself and... I'm going to check myself, and, and I'll come back and we'll talk about it. Okay, and then and that person goes away, and God convicts them and says, Hey, your, your, your spouse is right. You are out of line with that. And then they come to you and they say, You know, God convicted me. And when, what he convicted me of was that I, I have done this, this, and this. And I, and I know that it's harmed you. And I want to know, will you forgive me for my sin against you? Okay. I tell you where I go sideways on this issue uh, in counseling. Then, but resolution comes with repentance. Not that's it. That's the only way. I, I agree with that. Okay. Um, but you never. I, I, I'm not you, so I don't know why I get in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's hard for me to get the person who has all these issues off themselves. It's right. to me. I, mm -hmm. I, I, right, I, right. I, 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 my feelings, my thoughts, my ways. This is that. I, 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 I'm going. Man, all of a sudden, conversation with wallpaper makes more sense. Yeah. Okay, so what you're experiencing then is somebody who can't see past themselves is in a state of hardness. And the antidote to that is conviction. Conviction always makes me look at me. Okay, but what if the they flip person? that over and become, they like being a victim? Well, see, then you have, a, then you have so then you have the other side of hardness. Where right. Instead of an angry, you know, prickly, outward, you know, appearance, you have the victim stance, which is that, you know, why is everybody picking on me? You know, yeah. It's, yeah, but people, some people like being the victim. Well, it's their identity. It works. That's why. Okay, it works. So makes total sense. Yeah, so, you know, and, and that's why I say to many people, like, if somebody's being a victim, you have to have a boundary with them mm. because that's like giving energy to a black hole. Mm. <clears throat> and so what I say to people all the time is, it, is this, Perry, look, in a relational sense, when you're having these relational issues, and, and, and I believe this in marriage. Um, you have to be willing to put the relationship on the altar. You have to be willing to give the relationship up. Because if you're not willing to go to that length, you'll be manipulated by the other person. Um, question. Okay. <clears throat> Is there such things as legitimate anger? Absolutely. Because wouldn't that be seen as hardness of heart? 
uh, wouldn't that be seen as so, out of control? Wouldn't that be seen as not loving and not having a soft heart? Well, you know, I think that there are, I think that anger is, <clears throat> well, I mean, be angry and sin not. Well, and I like how Peterson um, translates that. He says, go ahead, be angry. You'd be, you'd do well to be angry. Just don't let your anger be used for revenge. And I think that's where anger takes a bad turn. If you slap me, and it hurts me, and I get angry, that's a pro- that's, that anger is appropriate. It lets me know, hey, something was wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> if I take that anger, and then I use that anger as motive to get you back, now my anger has gone to a place that's unhealthy. But feeling the anger is a normal, healthy thing. Okay, what I do with the anger can be healthy and lead to something redemptive, or it can be destructive. Right? So, but we, we've, in the church, I think we've made, uh, we've made a sin out of anger. Yeah. I mean, Jesus got angry. Oh, he did, you know. <laughs> uh, hardness of heart. Um, so, when I come back, I want you to put the <laughs> stethoscope on us. And, okay. Uh, how do we do a self-examination All right. as to whether or not we're harboring something that could be in the heart, hard heart category? Glad uh, to We'll be so. right back with Patrick Doyle. Hi, I'm Dan Lynn. I work at the Dove TV. You know, compared to Portland, Seattle, and L.A., Medford might be considered a small market, but at the Dove, we're excited about the opportunity to make a big impact right here in our community. And you help make that happen. Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us now by making a secure online donation at our website, thedove.us, or by phoning 541-776-5368. Well, we're back. A subject that uh, sooner or later we all have to kind of put the spiritual stethoscope, so to speak, on our heart and ask ourselves, are we suffering from a hard heart? And I don't think you can walk through this life without getting bumped around, if not beat up and abused, that some, sooner or later you have a hard spot. Yep. And it may be totally justified mm-hmm. and legitimate. But sooner or later you got to deal with it because it's interfering with your relationship with God mm-hmm. and what He really has for your life. Mm-hmm. And I do know that uh, I've, I've dealt with people who have gone through a divorce, and it's tough. I, I don't, this notion that divorces and people get over it is baloney. <laughs> Just takes a lot of time. Mm-hmm. And so, but you can get a person to the point where the hardness can go away, but the boundary can be set up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and the yeah. boundary can be a boundary not necessarily against one person, mm-hmm. but against all the reasons behind that hurt. Mm-hmm. You know, so which is another issue. Right. But how do we know? I mean, you you use this term uh, justify, minimize, <laughs> spiritualize. Right. What's the other one? Rationalize, yeah, but, deny. Yeah, you got all kinds <laughs> of them in there. Rationalize and deny. Those are f- the five <laughs> Patrick <laughs> excuses. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> so, but we know in our heart something's not quite right. We're not getting the spiritual breakthrough that we want. We're not feeling the intimacy with God that we desire, which we need to do a show on that yeah. because I'm watching people walk, go in the church and mm. walk out the same way. Uh-huh. What's this hour and a half been all about? Mm-hmm. You know, there is mm-hmm. no spiritual mm-hmm. int- intimacy connection. Right even with a great message or great worship. Mm-mm. But for us, I mean, we, we know that we're not quite in that spiritual content place. Mm-hmm. Is that a hard heart, blocking it? Probably. So how do we test ourselves? Well, the first thing I would say is when was the last time you repented? About 4.30 this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and if it's been longer than that, you've yeah. got a hard heart. Because yeah. here's the deal. Jesus said we are to confess our sins one to another that we might be healed. Right? right? James 5. I mean, James said that. Yeah, so if I sin every day, but I repent once a quarter. Yeah, yeah the equation's out of whack. And so subsequently, for me not to repent means I have to harden myself. Mm. Because I know if the Spirit of God's alive in me, I know. I know, but I rationalize, minimize, justify, spiritualize, deny. <laughs> so, and, and I don't deal with it. 
So <clears throat> that'd be the first thing I would do is I would say, when was the last time you repented? And when I say repent, I don't mean just to God. I mean like God tapped you, made you aware of your wrong, and then you went to the person that you harmed and you looked them in the eye and you said, you know what? I realize, God, by God's mercy, that I'm wrong. Will you forgive me for my sin of X against you? Okay. You know what? If we as a church did that on a regular basis, yeah. a lot of our problems would go away. Well, God might even heal our land. <laughs> we might start with us. Yeah. But we're so busy being right and looking good, we're not repenting. It's not even, I see here it all the time, Perry. It's, most people that I talk to say it's not safe for them to repent within their church. Yeah, I, that's another show, boy, a touchy one too. Right, and so, and, and so listen, that might be true in the church, but I guarantee you this, it is never true with God. He is always safe. He's always present. And I would start there. Okay. God, help me see where I'm wrong. Uh, maybe the person isn't around for you to go to and straighten things out. Yeah. But you still feel the hand of God yes. kind of tapping you on the shoulder. Yeah. And say, you need to deal with this. You need yeah. to deal with it. Right. Now the issue goes from that person to your relationship with God. Yeah. That mm -hmm. becomes the issue. Yeah. Right. 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 So God, help me to forgive. Help, grant me forgiveness. Help me to trust you for the justice of this situation where I've been harmed. And again, I would refer people back to that show on forgiveness and reconciliation mm -hmm. because it's important that you know the difference. Because if you don't know the difference, you're going to probably chase the wrong thing. So, um, somebody who's hardened and they don't know it, they don't repent. You see your kindness level consistently dropping. Say that loud and clear again. <laughs> you see your kindness level on a consistent decline. Mm -hmm. Your cynicism is on the incline. Yeah. Your compassion for people on the decline. You, you don't care about things or people particularly. See, we're, I think the church community, the faith community, is really struggling with that one. Mm. Um, just over certain social issues. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. We don't know how to love and restrain at the same time. Mm -hmm. We just, we don't know how to do that. Right. Well, and I think that that is a, that the ability to love someone in a difficult circumstance is really empowered by God. It's not empowered by my knowledge. It's a spiritual thing. It's not a religious thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's not a, you know, a tactic thing. Okay. So you're seeing, if your kindness level starts to decrease, that's a sign. If your tolerance level decreases, yeah, yeah, right, and you become rigid, you're rigid about things, okay, you know, well, so you, you have in Jesus' example, people in his entourage yeah. who were completely rejected by the, were the religious people. They were, they were, the Pharisees would not have touched these people. They're Gentiles, they're women, they're drunks, they're prostitutes, whatever. They're just not okay. <laughs> mm. Jesus, do you think Jesus was being drawn into their sin? No. W were they being affected by his love? Yeah. So if we could, if we could switch around the, the, our love being the draw point, not, and, and in our, our love doesn't mean... To love someone doesn't mean to join them in the what's destroying them. Yeah. Love means to be present, to be kind, to be compassionate, and have a boundary, and to give to that, instead of we have to have this wall of, if we get near that, then we'll get it. Well, God's not strong enough. Get more. I mean, I am around difficult things every day. I haven't, it hasn't, I haven't gotten it yet. I mean, I got enough inside of me. I don't need any help. Yeah. I mean, if, if, a part, if it wasn't for God's conviction, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't still be married. I wouldn't be a, I wouldn't be a dad anymore. I mean, it, the, Jeremiah says, the heart is exceedingly wicked and deceitful above all things. Mm -hmm. Who can understand it? Now, there's a base level of hardness right there. Yeah. We start that way. And so, uh, apart from God's intervention, that's where we're going to go. Yeah. Our natural gravity is too hardness. Our natural gravity is not to softness. So if you don't have an intimacy, say, with God, an ability for Him to communicate to you, 
then you're, I can tell you where you're going to go. And you can do this okay. completely in a re religious frame. Let me ask you a question before we run out of time here, and it's probably too big of a question to deal with in a few minutes, but give it a shot. There okay. are genuine victims out there. Absolutely. Every day. Okay. And there are people who have been victimized by circumstances and people. Yes. They're totally innocent. Yep. They've been t yep. by a yep. situation. Could yep. have been a spouse that cheated on them, whatever. Right. They're totally t An abuser, yeah, whatever, okay. yeah. What do you say? I mean, how, what do you say to them? Are you saying to them, your hurt and hard heart is unjustified? Yes, but with a caveat. Because your hard heart's hurting you, not the, vi not the victimizer. The person who harmed you, it, it's not doing anything to them. Your hard heart's destroying you. So God wants for you to be able to forgive them, which, again, doesn't mean saying what they did is okay, letting them harm you some more. No. And it doesn't mean reconciliation. And it doesn't mean reconciliation. Right. right. So your being able to forgive them is allowing you to be freed of their harm and then live free of their harm to you. That's a process, it's not immediate, but that hardness does not serve you to have a peaceful life. Mm -hmm. Some people I see it all the time, the hardness, and it was true in my life, this was me. My hardness, my anger, my fury was what helped me survive the pain. And it's what kept me out of um, uh, being harmed further. But in that process, I was destroying myself. Mm -hmm. So when God came into the picture and he says, look, son, I want you to forgive your dad. I don't want you to carry this anymore. So I say it all the time. My dad's harm of me was like this giant open wound in my soul. And if the wind blew strong enough, you know, I'm reacting. And it didn't, ha and it, it, it didn't have to be much. And when I react, whose life does that mess up? Mine. Mm -hmm. So God comes along and through the process, the process, not the event of forgiveness, he starts to take that open wound my dad never repented. He never said he was sorry. He died in that condition. He never was never dealt with in that way. God allowed me the process, granted me the, the the gift of forgiveness over time, and that open wound went from open to a scar. Now you can tap my scar, and I'm not going to react. And I got a scar to remember because I'm not going to forget what happened. Okay, and that's the other thing I think people say is just forget it. Well, I wish I could. So now, if you tap an open wound or you tap a scar, you get two different reactions. Yeah, good and, point. And so when you tap on the, the open wound, you're creating more harm for yourself because you're reactive, you're intense. It's re-harming it's re, it's re, uh, you with the, where, where that old wound was. And now I have a scar, so I don't react. In fact, my scar... The healing that God's done in my life for my abuse, every single day, Perry, comes into play. In some way, I can understand someone. My, my struggle with addiction, my struggle with hardness of heart, my struggle in my marriage, my struggle with my children, because of God's redemptive work, that comes into play in a positive way. Now, if there wasn't redemption, hmm. it would be a harm, it would, it would trigger me and I'd be spun out. In the early days of my counseling career, I was, I was triggered every day because I was unhealed. And so God used that triggering to force me into some healing. <laughs> wow, uh, big stuff. All right, uh, Veritas Counseling, 541-622-6018. 622-6018. Or VeritasCounseling.com. VeritasCounseling.com. You can check it out there. Uh, you can watch the show again uh, and replay all this again by going to the Dove website. It should be up on the website in a couple of hours. It'll also be archived on Roku if you want to share it with a friend or send that link to somebody. Let me encourage you to do that. But yeah. deal with the hardness of your own heart and you'll watch and see how quickly other things fall into place. So, yeah. Thanks, buddy. You bet. My pleasure. We'll see you next time on Focus Today. Hi, I'm Jim and I work at the Dub TV. Every weekday between 6 and 8 a.m., our award-winning news and sports team bring you the best morning show around. It's live, it's honest, and it's a whole lot of fun. And you help make it happen. 
Did you know that more than 90% of our income comes from people like you? You can help us continue to air local programs that share your voice by making a secure online donation at our website, thedub.us.